So you're looking to install exterior insulation on your roof assembly, but how do you actually do it? This is one of the most common questions we receive from both design professionals and builders alike. In this video, we're gonna give you three different strategies that you can use to integrate exterior insulation for your roof system, as well as discuss some of the critical details that you need to get right before you start. Let's get into it. So we have a mock-up here of our first assembly. This is probably the most common or conventional way to integrate exterior insulation in a roof assembly with the least amount of structural complexity. Our rafters are cantilevered, forming the overhang. This could also be your trusses, but the point is that the overhang is part of the roof structure. Very typical construction. Then, installed over our sheathing, we have a self-adhered membrane which is serving as the air barrier in this assembly, in this case, grace ice and water shield. Now we have to have an air barrier installed between our rigid insulation above and the roof sheathing below. This is because moisture-laden air from the interior migrates through the seams of the sheathing and ends up condensing in the upper parts of the assembly. And in fact, we have dealt with numerous failures from a lack of an air barrier in these types of assemblies. Next, we have our rigid insulation. We can use any rigid insulation of our choosing. In this case, we have Rockwool Comfort Board, but you can absolutely use XPS, polyiso, or wood fiber insulation. Now, ideally, we wanna make sure that we have two layers of rigid insulation with staggered and offset joints to prevent convective loops and heat loss at the seams, as well as the telegraphing of the seams on the roof covering. The amount of exterior insulation that you need is dependent on the climate zone you're building in, the total R value of the assembly, and the interior temperature and relative humidity that you're operating under. We then install a nailer, or a couple of nailers, to terminate the edge of the rigid insulation and to provide a fastening base for the first course of the second layer of sheathing. Now, at this point, we can decide whether we want to have a vented roof covering or if we want to leave this completely unvented. If you leave this assembly completely unvented, there is a small risk of trapping moisture that finds a path inside. Basically, we are creating a vapor sandwich between the roof covering and underlayment, the insulation, and the air barrier membrane below. If you have a roof covering other than asphalt shingles like standing seam metal, tile, or cedar shingles, we can actually build in some drying potential by using a vapor permeable underlayment in combination with a drainage mat like cedar breather. This way, if moisture does get inside, it can at least dry to the exterior into that gap through the vapor permeable underlayment. If you use asphalt shingles, it's probably best to try to vent that roof covering by installing some furring strips between the rigid insulation and the second layer of plywood or OSB since we can't dry through those impermeable shingles. Couple other small but important details. We run a piece of that self-adhered membrane down and over the nailer and subfascia before installing the drip edge. This protects the subfascia and framing from water potentially migrating behind it if the drip edge fails to break surface tension. Then we install the drip edge and lap our primary underlayment over it so that if any water drains onto the surface of the underlayment, it will be discharged over the drip edge rather than running underneath it. This is a really important detail if you want a functional drip edge. Now on the interior side, because we have the overhang formed by the rafters or the top cord of the trusses, we need to provide blocking between those structural members and air seal between each of these penetrations. Otherwise, we're just going to have outside air migrating inwards unrestricted. We don't want that if we have this unvented roof system with a conditioned attic. We generally like to use rigid foam because it's easy to cut and then air seal that transition using a spray applied air barrier membrane like Viscon. Some people address this using spray foam. We steer away from spray foam for a number of reasons, but that's another technique that can be used to air seal and insulate this transition at the roof to wall interface. Now, as you might expect, this isn't exactly a thin roof profile, especially if you're adding five or six inches of rigid insulation, and in addition to that, venting the roof covering. Some people don't mind the wider fascia, but a lot of people want to achieve a much thinner profile. We actually discussed this in depth in our brand new continuous insulation course designed specifically to help you navigate these new continuous insulation requirements and learn how to integrate continuous insulation strategies successfully for a wide range of building assemblies so that you can have a durable, long-lasting home or building. Go and take our free training and get 15% off the course, no commitment necessary, we just ask for an email. Become the expert that your team needs you to be. Links are in the description below. This brings us to our next assembly, where instead of forming the overhangs with the cantilevered rafters or top cords, we are actually framing the roof structure flush with the exterior walls. Now, this lets us do a few things. For one, we get a really nice monolithic transition between the WRB installed on the walls, in this case blue skin, which is also serving as the air barrier for the walls, and the air barrier installed over the structural sheathing. 
All we have to do is lap our peel and stick membrane right over the exterior walls and tape the joint for that final air seal. In this case, we really do need that air sealing tape to connect these two dissimilar materials as the ice and water shield product doesn't stick very well to the surface of the blue skin. The tape that we are using is a highly aggressive, pressure-sensitive acrylic flashing tape that's compatible with both substrates and sticks very aggressively. You really have to try hard to peel it off. But overall, the key benefit is that we don't have to deal with all those pesky rafter penetrations in the air barrier. You could absolutely do this with zip system. I think Matt Reisinger on the Build Show refers to this as monopoly framing, but the idea is that everything is flush so that we have no rafter penetrations and so that we set ourselves up successfully for that air barrier transition. So to provide the overhangs, we are using an outrigger system, which essentially these two by fours that are fastened into the roof structure with these heavy duty wood screws. We really like the Simpson SDWS screws and those outriggers will be fastened based on your structural engineers, fastening schedule and specifications, which is largely dependent on the size of the overhang and the loads imposed on it. Obviously, smaller overhangs are going to be easier to integrate, whereas deep overhangs will likely require a more heavy duty outrigger system. Now, in many cases, your outriggers don't actually need to extend all the way up to the ridge, so you're usually not getting a huge thermal bridge, and we don't have a massive fascia profile. You wouldn't even notice that this roof has exterior rigid insulation unless you peeled back the soffit board. Now again, same as the previous strategy, you can choose to vent the roof covering or leave it unvented. All of the same principles apply. Use prudence and your best judgment. Now, the problem with all of these strategies is that they tend to be quite labor-intensive and complex. Roofers often decline projects that have exterior rigid insulation or will charge a premium to install it because they have to take into account the learning curve. One strategy that we've been using lately that a lot of builders and roofers have been liking is this prefabricated system from Hunter Panels called CoolVent. And no, this is not a sponsored video. We frequently specify and recommend this product and think that a lot of you would benefit from knowing about it. This is essentially a piece of high-density polyiso foam insulation that's bonded to 2 by blocking and a layer of sheathing, which is your nail base. This eliminates all of the additional steps of installing the rigid insulation in two layers, fastening furring strips or purlins through the rigid insulation and into the structural deck, fastening an additional layer of OSB or plywood, and then having the roofer install the underlayment and roof covering. We eliminate pretty much all of those steps, except for the underlayment and roof covering with this single product. I believe you can get up to 4 inches of polyiso bonded to it, which gives you around R24 continuous on the exterior side, and you can bolster that if you really wanted to by installing an additional layer of rigid insulation beneath it, also if you wanted those staggered and offset joints. But this greatly simplifies the whole process of installing exterior insulation and all the other components above it. The best part is that you don't actually need to hit a rafter or truss top cord when you're installing the stuff. It just needs to achieve the proper embedment into the structural sheathing. Hunter Panels has all this technical information on their installation guide from fastener specs to fastening schedule. Obviously, you'll work with your structural engineer to integrate this system, but this is probably one of the best ways to get exterior insulation on a residential roof. We still need our air barrier membrane installed between the structural sheathing and the hunter panel. Apart from that, it's extremely simple. Now, they do make a product without the blocking, which is just a simple piece of OSB or plywood bonded to polyiso insulation. However, the main benefit of having the blocking there is to facilitate ventilation above the rigid insulation so that if the top layer of sheathing gets wet, it can dry into that air gap. Whereas if we don't have the air gap there, there's a higher potential for deterioration if there is a leak. Guys, if you found this video helpful, make sure to leave a like and subscribe for more weekly building science videos and head over to our website at asiri-designs.com where we have over 150 free building science articles that cover a wide range of topics. Links will be in the description below. For now, good luck with your projects. Cheers.